Brian Roger, chest crushed, arm and leg bitten to the bone. Rodney Fox, ribs smashed, arm ripped, lung torn. Henry Bourse, left leg bitten off below the knee. These three Australians were attacked without warning by the great white shark. These three Americans traveled 9,000 miles to Australia for their confrontation with the death machine. teeth, serrated, razor sharp, 50 in front for biting, 390 inside waiting to replace the old ones. Six rows on top, eight on the bottom. Their owner, a 12 foot, 1400 pound great white shark. Some people call it the death machine. We're told that in no other animal has the power to inflict injury been so well combined with the will to do so. Books and movies have made the great white nature's ultimate villain. Few of us believe all the popular legends, but diver Rodney Fox knows firsthand how terribly real they can be. This dramatization shows what happened to him. 1963, Albinga Reef. Rodney and 40 other men are competing in the South Australian Spearfishing Championship. In the same waters, a white shark attacked and nearly killed his friend Brian Roger the previous year. Rodney sells insurance but plays soccer and stays in top physical condition. No scuba gear is allowed, only breath holding. Competition rules allow only edible fish and only two of a kind to be taken. After five hours, the total weight will be counted with bonus points for a certain fish. From the beginning of the contest, blood and struggling fish in the water are sending out a message, food. The message is received. Twenty feet down, Rodney lines up a rare fish in the sights. He doesn't see the death machine coming. Something huge hits me hard on the left side. Push me widely through the water. My body's in a vice. A shark has me in its jaws. I'm trapped. The eyes gouge him out. My hand goes down its mouth over those terrible teeth. Pull it out. My arm, it's slashed. It's useless. He's coming again. He's got my fish rod. I'm attached to it. I'm going out to sea. I'm drowning. I feel so weak. My quick release. It's my only chance. It doesn't work. floated up to the surface, but his chance to survive seemed nil. He was pulled aboard a boat, his rib cage, stomach, and lungs exposed. The bones of his arm bared, his ribs crushed, one lung punctured. Only his wetsuit held him together. A chest surgeon on duty that Sunday afternoon was ready when Rodney was brought in barely clinging to life. The operating team began the impossible task of piecing together the torn man. Four hours later, they succeeded, 
and Rodney's story became headlines around the world. But Rodney's scars and 462 stitches tell the story better. Do you hope to continue skin diving one day? I'll get in the water somewhere, sometime, but I don't know. After he recovered, Rodney never stopped feeling the mystical allure of the sea, and he began diving again. Years later, three Americans who felt that same allure sought his expertise to guide them through SeaWorld's new shark tank in San Diego. John Fudens, veterinarian from Oakdale, New York. Carl Rossler, travel agent from San Francisco. John Bell, banker from Marion, Indiana, join Rodney, who will help prepare them for their coming confrontation. As a world center for oceanographic research, Southern California provides an ideal location to study sharks. Ron and Valerie Taylor, who did underwater photography for Jaws and Blue Water White Death, are on hand to share their knowledge of the dangerous sharks. SeaWorld shark expert Ray Keyes will also share his wealth of shark behavior information with them during their stay in San Diego. Hot little sharks there. Beautiful little fellow. This unique building houses the world's largest collection of dangerous sharks. A 400,000 gallon aquarium built exclusively for sharks not only allows the public to view them in a natural setting, it allows research that would be impossible or difficult in the sea. Beautiful, beautiful pool. We spent a lot of time trying to bring these animals here uh, for everyone's enjoyment. So much about sharks remains unknown, that knowledge of these extraordinary animals is able to advance quickly here. It's surprising that after his terrifying experience of being attacked by a great white shark, Rodney can still appreciate the beauty of these incredible creatures. You can actually see the beauty. You can understand that uh, why people uh, that have seen them do like sharks, and as you can see here. Rodney, is there any specific behavior pattern uh, that the great white has before he bites? Well, when they come up to, to take any type of bait or test either the cages by wrapping their teeth around them or perhaps the propeller of a rudder, rudder of a boat, they always put the membrane over their eyes, which is a white, turns white. And even a yard before they actually bite, you can see this membrane that covers over their eye to protect it. So if you're in a position where you're swimming with a white shark and it's swimming towards you and it starts to cover its eye, you know that you've got to do some defensive action. The sharks exhibit a kind of sawing behavior when they bite into prey. Do you see that in your tank? Now, Rod here. Rodney Fox knows all too well the answer to that question. Uh, taking large pieces of meat, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's a, the white sharks that we've attracted around the boat down in South Australia. When they come up, they normally grab hold of the piece of meat and shake their heads with those really sharp teeth tear the piece right out and when I was attacked and I'll show you the scars I uh, it grabbed hold of me and for some funny reason it didn't at all shake its head now you can see the the scars come right around here and its head was up through here with its back jaw here and what happened was it grabbed me and swam through the water and you can see the individual shark teeth there now what normally would happen would shake and completely tear that whole piece out and if it had it done I wouldn't have been here today. My heart's in there. The constant hum of filter pumps indicate chemical balance and temperature in the tank are closely simulating the ocean. Variations can be harmful to the sharks, even though they have the reputation of being nearly indestructible. Because of this delicate balance between the creatures and their environment, divers are rarely allowed to enter the tank. 
but an exception is made for Valerie Taylor because of her unique ability to relate to these unpredictable animals. She knows that any shark can be dangerous, and some of these species have been responsible for dozens of fatal attacks. Ray Keyes worries not only about Val's safety, but also about the physical and emotional well-being of his sharks. How will they behave if Valerie's presence disturbs them? Would it slide on over towards you? And, and what, watch out for the lemon shark, Valerie. They've got, they've got a mean reputation, but the bull shark should be all right. the sharks as the animals relate to a swimmer in their midst. Today, her confidence and easy movements among them give these sharks a sense of security, and for the moment, they seem to accept her into their world. While Ron Taylor is known for his cinematography, Valerie's made her own reputation taking still photographs. will be inquisitive, they'll come up close. Same with the tiger sharks, they'll be on the surface. They're both potentially dangerous, but I don't think they'll give you any trouble. If they come too close, just push them away. Okay, I think you can give it a go now. Have a look. The three men take their first step toward facing the most dangerous of all sharks, the great white. Even though they're expert divers, Ray requests them to stay in one end of the tank. But while it's a valuable experience facing sharks with the protective gate removed, it still doesn't prepare them for tomorrow's trip to work with blue sharks in the open sea and find out what it's like to be caught between hungry sharks and their food. Facing dangerous sharks in a controlled environment may be informative, but it's no substitute for being surrounded by hungry sharks in the open ocean. A 64-foot research vessel specially equipped for undersea studies takes the group to an area where Ray knows he can find sharks. A few miles offshore, the cool Pacific offers an ideal environment for many kinds of sharks, including an occasional great white. These men know that many attacks by sharks do not seem to be caused by hunger, but by some aggressive desire to defend territory. Any shark, no matter how small or how peaceful, must be treated with respect and caution, because it could become dangerous. Cages are used for the protection of divers when dangerous sharks are in the area. A large shark is strong enough to break into the cage, but when he touches its metal surface, he invariably veers off. The danger is in his getting entangled in the cage's tow line, pulling the cage into the open sea. normal men want to leave the comforts of home and travel thousands of miles to confront one of the ocean's deadliest animals. 
Well, all of them wanted the incredible experience of being inches away from the world's greatest predator. John Hudens developed a passionate interest in marine animals. Carl Rossler's travel business specializes in exotic underwater adventures. For John Bell, it's a dramatic change from his life as a banker and the chance to cap 21 years of diving with a great adventure. There's one other reason the men may not talk about. When they look into those jaws of death swimming just inches away, these men feel an excitement that can tell them much more about themselves than about the great white shark. A small collection boat has gone ahead and spent the morning attracting sharks with ground up fish called chum. Several dozen blue sharks are already on hand when the divers arrive. Weeks of planning and preparation make the men eager to get in the water. Although not as aggressive as the great white shark, blue sharks are still capable of seriously injuring or even killing a diver. In spite of that, the men ask their host, Ray Keyes, if they can go in without the cage. He agrees, but will post safety men in case even more aggressive sharks appear. Although the sea isn't man's natural environment, modern technology enables him to enter the alien world beneath the surface. A full wet suit insulates the diver from chilly water. A hood stops heat loss from the head. A faceplate allows vision underwater. Lead weights compensate for buoyancy. A tank of compressed air permits an hour's breathing at shallow depths. Special housings protect cameras from water and pressure. To swim with these animals in their own environment is a rare privilege only a few people will ever know. Visibility, we have a white shark come up, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> but the water is so murky to go out there oh, by yeah. itself. It's pretty murky. That's it. Until they're right in. You can't close. see them. You, you really can't, can't see them. The That's right. But you can certainly get close enough to pet them. Oh, yeah. Close. <laughs> right under the duck board here, you could just stroke them on yeah. the back, hang on to the door so he didn't like that too much. I didn't like them hanging on to the fins either. <laughs> <laughs> the blue sharks uh, have a sw similar swimming action to the great white, cruising around, nosing around all the time. Uh, they, uh, these are blue, the great whites are not white, they're a grey shark. But uh, is it going to be possible to pet the great white like the blue? <laughs> <laughs> with, the only difference with the great white is that you must, you must be inside a cage. Oh. <laughs> but you can, believe it or not, put your hand out of the cage and touch the great white. Really? After the mouth is gone past. I'll <laughs> photograph you. <laughs> With, uh, but okay. but there's, one, well. there's one thing you must remember. These little sharks here are tame pussycats compared okay. to the great white shark. After their first success, the divers are anxious to get back in the water.
John Hewden stays aboard to feed the sharks. Ray's worried because he knows more feeding might attract too many sharks and make them dangerously aggressive. It's safer if you do, if you hook them in, it doesn't hurt the shark. Looking at their mouth, I can see why you said they could inflict quite a, a bite if they wanted to. Pieces of torn fish fall into the water, and what Ray has feared now happens. A frenzy begins. sharks surround the divers. Swimming faster and faster, they bump into the divers. The last step before biting, and the divers realize they must leave the water now. They've learned a valuable lesson. Don't take any shark for granted, ever. That I've come to being bitten, I have. Uh, Literally had, had hold of the camera handle. And I was yeah. going like that. Yeah. Just kind of mouthing it. Oh, when we swam back, who was with me? Uh, I Paul was. and I swam with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just Oh, my God, they were all over the place. And one swam past me, he had a bit of meat in his mouth. I got his picture. <laughs> he came back three or four times with the tail of the fish yeah. that he had eaten sticking yeah. out of his mouth. Yeah. Looking into the camera, it was incredible. It was I, was, I thought, how are we going to get out? They're going to think we're just a big fish. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's about the yeah. time the one came up and grabbed hold of the camera. Well, very excited. No, it was yeah. very thick, right over right, here. Right, right off the boat right. over here. So getting into a lot of there. Here before yeah. It's yeah. Funeral, I think. yeah. John, I think you better quit feeding them. I guess they yeah, please. Get from this, I said now that the animals are actively feeding, Ray's crew has a perfect chance to capture one for his live exhibit. A small blue is caught. If Ron grabs the shark too far back on the tail, he could be struck by the rough skin or bitten. Even the teeth of a small shark would feel large around Ron's arm. This one weighs less than 60 pounds. A great white can weigh several thousand. Carefully, very carefully, Ray calms the shark and positions him in the box. Divers and biologists change boats, and the shark is taken quickly to shore. He could live several hours in the aerated box in the skiff, but the sooner he's brought to shore, the easier his adjustment to the shark tank will be. An escort vessel arrives to lead the skiff back to the aquarium. During the whole ride back, the shark is constantly cared for to ensure survival. The three Americans have seen passive sharks turn from beautiful, graceful animals into aggressive predators.
Australia. Dangerous reef, mating grounds for birds and sea lions, home of the great white shark. Rodney Fox had gone ahead to make preparations for the expedition. On the way out, Rodney describes an experiment he once made here. Trying to find out if a white shark would be attracted to a bright color, Rodney first threw a black-suited dummy in the water. The white shark ignored it. Aware that many scientists believe bright colors attract sharks, he took the same dummy and dressed it in a red vest. The test wasn't scientific, but would give him an idea if the theory was correct. As he waited for the shark, he remembered the day in 1963 when he was in the water and the great white shark stalked him and attacked. It's off the coast by Coffins Bay, there's have had one shark has been harassing the divers in such a way. And now with this other abalone diver up there without really any provocation coming up and being killed, some of the divers have developed a cage propelled by air with a little air motor that they used to propel themselves underwater and collect the abalone from out of it. And there were a couple of divers that were so upset because of this, um, of this one attack that they wouldn't go back really and work commercially without some protection. And so they're developing these cages. Even though a white shark could bite through it, a cage is still a diver's best protection. Few abalone divers use cages, though, because it slows them down and limits their mobility. Most prefer risking attack from the great white and make more money than cautious divers. When no sharks appear at Dangerous Reef, the boat moves to Memory Cove. Conditions seem ideal, and when Ron checks the bait, he sees bites have been taken. As it usually does, the great white has arrived unannounced. The cage, which is their only refuge from the white death, suddenly seems very frail protection. Years ago at Dangerous Reef, a white shark smashed in the side of a cage like this one. Fortunately, he never got to the diver inside. At last, the moment they'd spent months preparing for had come. For men who traveled so far with such great hopes, waiting is the hardest part. At first, I felt very isolated and almost totally alone, somewhat uneasy and waiting for the unexpected to occur. Here he comes. so majestic a creature that I forgot how deadly it really was. The male great white slowly investigates the intruders into his world. Here's a go, here's a go. For the moment, He's content to merely taste the bait and decide if he wants to eat. He's a hungry boy. Get your gob off of the tow rope, you big brute. Oh, 
was awesome. Uh, they were a huge shark in the water, with tremendous body size on it, and that cold black eye just looking at you as it goes by. some more close-ups, though, of him, him coming in and biting the cage. Maybe we'll get that tomorrow. But there, there was some nice footage, you know, coming through the water close. He bit the bottom of the other cage once. But the light's gone now. There's just, you know, it's five after seven. There's no way you're going to photograph that late. With no sharks in sight, they take a short trip to Hopkins Island, where a colony of sea lions lives. Unfortunately, these friendly creatures are considered a delicacy by the sharks. Come on! Let's meet Daddy. Let's... Several divers have been attacked while swimming among sea lions. Perhaps they were unlucky victims of mistaken identity. Oh, oh I'm thinking. Valerie knows the great white may be lurking in the water, but the temptation to film the sea lions proves irresistible. It's a calculated risk. Bruno Vallati, and he wanted to shoot some sea lions at Hopkins Island. 
and Ron and Bruno and myself went in with the sea lions and suddenly, we'd been filming for about an hour, and suddenly the sea lions just scattered and there was nothing. There was just Ron and Bruno and myself and we knew there was a shark because we knew when uh, Henry Boss was taken that the sea lions had scattered and left Henry and that's all the shark had to get. And Ron and I crouched down into the weeds and drew our knives and looked around. We couldn't see anything. But Bruno didn't understand because he'd never been here before. And I took my mouthpiece out and called out, shark, and he heard, and he got down too. We were looking for it, and suddenly, just out of the haze in the distance, the sort of milky haze, yes, it came, and it came so quickly. It just burst upon us and shot through, and I heard all the cylinders go, whack, whack. And we crouched down and it came shooting back and this big black eye was looking at us. And we crept along the bottom and climbed out on some rocks. <laughs> so uh, we sat on the rock for quite some time, during which period Bruno decided he'd have to go back to America straight away. <laughs> and eventually we plucked up the courage to swim back to the temptation because we knew that if the shark came through again, the sea lions would let us know. Val's love of animals keeps her with him as long as her air lasts. She's confident the sea lions will warn her if danger comes. The divers have returned to the boats and so have the great white sharks. But this time they're bigger and hungrier than before. As the men prepare their equipment, Rodney's feeding draws the sharks in closer and closer. You can pass over quite a few of those baits. He's got a white spot on his head. Yesterday's dive with smaller sharks now seems only a warm up, judging from the size and power of these. Everyone agrees that of the 25 or so species that are the most dangerous, the great white is in a class by himself. He is the most powerful and most aggressive of all sharks, a lethal combination. Has he had anything to eat yet, Rodney? Yes, one. One piece. Where did he take it from? Oh, here. Right there. Yeah. Oh, that's probably where you'll take it again. There's a piece right in there. Little is known of the great white except what it eats. The greatest predator in the sea. They have no enemies. They eat whales, porpoises, fish, seals, even other sharks.
bring smaller people. John takes up more than half a cage. <laughs> well, make a piece of size in the back. Have a Actually, they usually only bite people. They don't seem to like the taste of human flesh. Unfortunately for their victims, they take big bites. Well, that was fantastic, that, that last bite. Yeah. Did you catch him shot the ground when he with the nearly had his camera? Knocked it and bumped it. Whoa, and he ended up over there. Which one was it? There's one lying on the bottom that he bit off. He's gonna uh, find it eventually. The sheer presence of the shock is overwhelming, particularly as he comes up two, three feet away from the cage or even literally bites into the cage. You get a much better perspective of what this animal is like and it's awesome to realize that he has not changed basically in the millions of years that he's been on earth my gold and my desire, my fantasy, to film this shark in his own environment. Uh, they are truly a magnificent and beautiful animal.
What? We waited Son of a little did I get that? Boy, I slapped off about eight of The three Americans have accomplished their goal of confronting the world's ultimate predator. They've joined the few divers who've been able to face the great creature and neither harm it nor be harmed by it. I don't know. If it was just one of them and I had two, probably I'd take a chance on it. The one that sticks out most in my mind is the one where uh, a thing came up from the bottom, took a bait right in front of us, and we had... Uh, the shark's belly and fins and mouth wide open, just sitting there shaking the bait right at the surface. And just spectacular. I just never really believed that I would see that. It was beautiful. Had a couple of good shots, you know, they're on the belly of the mouth, just like this, about three feet away. Look at that, he's back. John Fudens, veterinarian. Carl Rossler, travel agent, photographer. John Bell, banker. Three men who found the ultimate experience of their lives, a confrontation with the world's greatest predator, the death machine. Divers daring to seek the world's fiercest predator know they can easily become its victims. But by taking that chance, they've achieved the ultimate underwater experience. And by leaving the white shark in peace, they've also expressed the ideal of the modern adventurer, to enjoy nature without destroying it. Fortunately, the great white shark is rarely seen, but it's out there in this ocean, in every ocean, challenging us to conquer our deepest fears. Mm -hmm. 